Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, bringing us back to Arkansas safely. We thank you for all of us. Thank you for a night's of rest. And we ask as we take up this study this morning that you grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit. Pour your latter rain out upon us. Um, we want to understand this message that's opening up in a way that would edify us and give us the ability to give a, a warning message to those that we come in contact with. And we ask that you'd help us accomplish that work in us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. In terms of this particular series that I'm doing, I was unsure when I went to California here whether Paul would be there to record, and he was. So we did for Friday night presentation, and then I think we did four on Sabbath, didn't we, in the daytime? Okay, so there's five presentations that we did in Portola that would be part of this. And as soon as I've connected Clayton with Paul, as soon as they connect, uh, we'll make all those five available. And if you're going to watch these things sequentially, then that would follow what we did here last in my, the material I'm presenting. And this is, uh, the notes today are kind of a, a summary of some of the things that we got to on Sabbath in Portola. Um, some, most of them that we'd already referred to here before we went to Portola, but I want to catch us up um, before we move on. And I want to um, get to the point where I started kind of teasing a brother in Africa. I hope that um, he accesses this material where he can see that I'm using his name in public and not hear about it behind the scenes. He goes by the, he goes by the uh, texting name Muku Prime, but his name is Tendai. Okay, Muku Prime is an African expression that means number one uh, son-in-law. Um, kind of like number one son, only it's, from what I understand, it's son-in-law. And I watched him on the texting last week, he was challenging uh, what justification we have for using numbers and dates and whatever. And I liked what he was saying. I, he, I'm not being critical of him at all um, because some of the dates or, or numbers that people have chosen um, seem to be kind of random, random and then they try to make a, a, a claim about them that seems a little bit fanatical. And he's he was raising questions about, you know, what's your justification for, for putting this kind of definition on this number or this date? So I thought it was a worthwhile discussion that he was having. But I used, his, used him as a point of reference to actually introduce some of those ideas. And that's where I want to try to get to, uh, at least get started by the end of this presentation. Up here... This is kind of where we ended up in Portola. Uh, this doesn't, the, the main thing that I was trying to put in place in Portola was uh, Japan, Nagasaki, Hiroshima. Um, I spent more time there than anywhere else. Um, and I'm not addressing that here, and I will come back to that in our studies as well. Uh, but one of the conclusions that we came to um, which we've seen here is that we're identifying that in the story of the king of the south, remember there's four kingdoms in Daniel 11. There's the dragon, the beast, the false prophet, and the kingdom of the 144,000. And the particular story for the dragon that, that structures the, the testimony of the dragon in Daniel 11 is the story of the struggle of the king of the south. So, in, in the story of the king of the south, which is played out with a, a struggle between the United States and Russia at the end, um, we're identifying July 18th as Rafia and December 25th, 2021 as Paneum. And I'm arguing that <clears throat> if you're actually going to take uh, verses, the, the verses 10 through 15 in Daniel 11 where Rafi and Paneum are actually marked. Sister Kathy, right. um, if you're going to do that, the, play, the place they get applied more perfectly is in the story of the King of the South, of the struggle between Russia and the United States that leads to uh, 
the Sunday Law, the Threefold Union. But you can see the, the similar dynamics in these lines. Um, in the kingdom of the 144,000, you have three stories that I'm arguing primarily tell the story of the 144,000, and they're based upon three attributes of Christ, that he's a prophet, a priest, and a king. So the lines of prophecy that deal with the struggle between a true and false prophet in the kingdom of the 144,000, I'm saying, plays out in Carmel. And I'm saying the prediction that Tess made about November 9th, 2019, was the offering of the priest of the groves and the prophets of the Baal. And as we know, virtually nothing that she claimed about um, November 9th came true. And I'm saying that Elijah's prophecy is July 18th, the prediction of Nashville. And that in that respect, for the kingdom of the 144,000 in the line of the prophets, you see the same dynamics of Raphia and Paneum. First, um, the king of the south wins, then the king of the north wins. Up here, uh, this here we, we hadn't done it in here, and this is why you need to go back and look at the presentations in Portola. Uh, we used the third trumpet and the sixth trumpet the third trumpet and the second woe uh, to line up with this way mark which we identify as the midnight cry and in so doing we answered a question that didn't get raised here the last time that I presented here and I made this point out in Portola that I'd raised this point and no one in this group challenged me on it um, not that you should have or, or should not have but I was using that logic to make the point and it was this, um, I'll tell you what the point is. When we laid this out in our last presentation here, um, we're saying that this is the story of Russia, okay? Russia uh, wins here, loses here, comes to its conclusion here. The king of the south's all over here. Now you get Sunday law, threefold union, everyone following my logic. And I never went no further because I went out of time and I thought, well, someone may challenge me and you didn't. And the reason that you should have or could have challenged me is really July 18th and December 25th. Our justification for those waymarks is not Russia. It's Islam. Okay, so I'm putting these waymarks down and I'm saying that it's Russia, it's Russia. And no one said, well, what about Islam? So in Portola... I took that up and said it, it, it's Islam and Russia and we showed that in the third trumpet Attila the Hun um, the roots of Russia come from the disintegration of Attila the Hun's army after he died I think it's either his two sons or his two brothers fight for control of his empire one gets removed from history and the other one just retires into an area in Eastern Europe that becomes the birthplace of Russia. So the Russians trace their their blood lineage back to the Huns. Okay, so when it comes to the third trumpet, Attila the Hun, you have a link to Russia. But of the seven trumpets, Attila the Hun being the third, of the seven trumpets, there's only two trumpets where the the person that is the symbol of the trumpet is identified as a falling star. Attila the Hun is one of them. Attila the Hun is a falling star. But the fifth trumpet, or the first woe, it's Muhammad who's a falling star. So when you go to Attila the Hun, you can show that he has a connection with Russia. He's, you know, their heritage, I guess you could say. But he also prophetically has a connection with Muhammad. So Attila the Hun has both Russia and Islam, okay? And, and we put the third trumpet right here at the midnight cry, July 18th. So what I was doing in Portola was answering the question that never got really, uh, never was challenged when I was here. And then I went to the three woes. Um, and we understand and have taught, and by the way, 
what I was teaching about Attila the Hun and the third trumpet and what I'm going to teach about the woes. This is what we taught several years ago. This isn't something that we're, we're pulling lines together to try to justify our position. This is stuff that was already in the public record. And in the public record, the basic logic was is that the third woe arrived at 9-11, uh, but you can't have a third without a first and a second. Okay, so we, we would take 9-11 uh, onward in that prophetic line and we would show where the three woes all take place in the history of 9-11 uh, onward. And we would do so, we would mark 9-11 as the first woe, which is the fifth trumpet. And our justification for doing that is in the first woe of the fifth trumpet, there is a 150 year prophecy. And our second witness that allowed us to anchor the first woe to 9-11 was the story of Elizabeth and the, the birth of John the Baptist. Because at 9-11, Zechariah rejects the message the angel gives him that your aged wife is going to have a baby. So he's made dumb. And he's not going to speak until the birth of John. And we mark that at the Sunday Law. Because that's where he speaks. That's where... Balaam's ass speaks, that's where the United States speaks, that's where the vision of Habakkuk 2 speaks. All the speaking takes place at the Sunday Law, but nine months before, Zechariah is made dumb, and his wife Elizabeth goes into hiding for 150 days, for five months, and that lines up with the 150 year time prophecy of the first woe. So we understood that when it comes to the third woe arriving at 9-11, that it has with it all three woes, and we would put the first woe, the fifth trumpet at 9-11, and it would go until the midnight cry. At the midnight cry, you would have the second woe, the sixth trumpet, and then at the Sunday law over here, you would have the third woe, um, the Sunday law. And what we understood is that from 9-11 over here to the midnight cry was 150 years of Revelation 9 or 150 days of Elizabeth's pregnancy when she's in hiding. But when you get to this point in 1449, July 27, 1449, then you have a four-year history. Now I'm talking about the second, well, the sixth trumpet. We've already talked about the third trumpet, Attila the Hun, and how Attila the Hun prophetically is speaking to both Russia, the blood lineage of Russia, and Islam because it's a falling star just as Muhammad was a falling star. But now in the sixth trumpet, which is second woe, we have in July of 1449 a four-year period where not Muhammad the first, he's dead and gone hundreds of years before, but who's ruling in this history is Muhammad II. Okay, so that allows you once again to connect with Islam very nicely. Muhammad II's in this history. And the historians tell us that in the history of 1449 to 1453, okay, and this is the transition uh, that begins the 391 year 15 day time prophecy that leads you to August 11th, 1840. In this beginning history, there's a four-year period, and in the middle of this four-year period, Muhammad II wakes up at midnight, and that's what the historians record, at midnight, and he, and midnight cry, of course, would be midnight, and he calls in his, his vice president, or whatever the title of is this guy, and he says, I want to take over Constantinople. This is where he gets convicted that he's going to take over Constantinople. And he begins his war against Constantinople right here. And he's got to blow down the walls of Constantinople. And when I say walls of Constantinople, you can picture in your mind the walls that go around the city. And I think grammatically it's okay if there's a wall that goes around the city to call it the walls of Constantinople, right? With a, with a plurality connected to it, even though it might only be one wall. But in reality, the historians tell us with Constantinople, it had a double wall. Okay, so Constantinople's walls, in the, in the legitimate plural, they got to get blown down right here. And this is the place in the story of Balaam and the ass, where the ass is between two walls, okay, narrow walls. 
and is going to crash Balaam into the wall and, and wreck his foot. Point being is, Constantinople, the walls of Constantinople are going to go down here and they are double walls. Um, but how do they how do they blow down those walls? And I'm, I'm, help me if you... I would want to remember this. I know this guy's name, but the way that, that the walls get blown down is Muhammad, he connects with a, a guy from Romania, I believe, from Eastern Europe, that's a cannon maker. And his name is, this is what I want to remember, Paul remembered his name as something like, and when I hear it, I know it. Anyway, in history, he reaches out to this cannon maker. The cannon maker has been designing these, these tremendously powerful cannons. He tried to sell them to the Romans, the Roman Empire, but they were broke. They didn't have the money. So he reaches out to Muhammad, and Muhammad, sa Muhammad says, I'll take your cannon. And uses the cannon to tear down the wall, to blow down the walls of Constantinople. And his name almost... Urban. Urban. There you go. There you go. Um, so, what's the point? The point is, is here at this way mark, whether it is the third trumpet, Attila the Hun has characteristics prophetically of Islam and characteristics in his blood of Russia. You see a connection between Russia and Islam. And then here in the sixth trumpet, the second woe, you have Islam going to attack Constantinople, but in order to do so, it hires a, uh, a munish, munition uh, expert to develop the weapons that it needs, and it gets this from someone in Eastern Europe. Okay, so if you're willing to see it, you got two witnesses with the third trumpet and the sixth trumpet. And what's the third trumpet and the sixth trumpet? won't go there, but it's three and six, um, that, are, that are showing a connection between Islam and Russia. Islam, Eastern Europe. Suggesting that Islam gets the nuclear weapon it's going to use on Nashville from Russian sources. Okay, so we, that's, we spent some time with that in Portola just to catch up. But once again, I'm saying when it comes to Rafi and Paneum, taking them out of Daniel 11 and implying them on, applying them on one of these lines, that it's speaking about this, this story, the struggle between Russia and the United States, which I'm saying the title of this story is the King of the South. Here at Carmel, we have a similar dynamics. Um, first, the liberal wins here, Russia. Islam. First, the liberal wins here. Uh, their prediction about November 9th totally decimated this movement in, in terms of the separation that it caused. And praise the Lord, it, that separation went that way because you needed, you needed to have that influence eliminated in order to move forward in history. But over here, uh, the King of the South comes to its end forever, okay, as it transitions into the threefold union. And so too here, um, the prediction about July 18th, this being the story of Elijah, when fire comes down upon Elijah's offering, then Elijah um, executes the 850 prophets of Baal and priests of the grove. They come to a conclusion here. This is the liberal uh, struggle in this history that comes to a conclusion here, just where the liberal side of it comes to a conclusion up here as well. And then where I got to at another line, the line of the Constitution, um, which is the story of the false prophet, the kingdom of the false prophet, the story of the kingdom of the false prophet in Daniel 11 has to do with the Constitution. And it's played out between, once again, liberals and conservatives, the liberals being the Democrats, the conservatives being the Republicans. And they have the same kind of dynamic, I believe, as Rafi and Paneum, but it's not really Rafi and Paneum. Uh, same dynamic, the liberals win first. Um, I have December 10th, that's when the articles of impeachment were drawn up, but actually you could start it over here on uh, 
in 2017 on 2020 because when he was inaugurated, that's when they began their efforts to produce these articles of impeachment. Um, and then I have 2520 up here, and why do I have 2520 up there? Because it's on February 5th, 2020, that he's acquitted. And so I'm saying that this is where the liberals win. This is their victory, short-lived as it was. And this is where the Republicans win. And what I'm saying is this, this here, this acquittal, and I'm, I'm going to mean what I'm saying. And if it's the first time you thought it, you might say that I'm, it's a stretch, but it's not. This is the end of the Democratic Party. Period. They're done. Now, well, the reason I'm saying this, I'm not saying that this is Paneum and Raffia or this is Paneum and Raffia, but I'm saying they carry the same kind of characteristics as Paneum and Raffia. And over here, Russia comes to its end, the King of the South. Um, so does the United States, by the way, but Russia comes to its end, the Liberal Party comes to its end in this story. And over here, at the execution of the priests of the grove and the prophets of Baal by Elijah, the Liberal Party comes to its end. That gives you two witnesses that here at the acquittal, they're, they're all over. And if you care to look at it, you can see the, not just the Democrats, but the, the, the liberal news media, it's collapsing. Okay, so if what we're saying is correct, uh, forget about their, their political disintegr disintegration that's taking place, and it is. Uh, but on July 18th, you know that Trump's going to implement martial law. Any reasonable leader would do so. You got a country that's just attacked with a nuclear weapon. It's all hands on deck, and you implement martial law. And this will be the fulfillment of Sister White saying active despotism will, will come into this country. Despotism being a word that means dictatorship. And this, no doubt, will be the beginning of the civil war that takes place in the United States. The point being is, from this point onward, it, it, there isn't, we're talking about having an election in November of 2020. Forget about it. And, and that's illegal in the Constitution. In wartime, you can cancel an election. And that, but even if they don't cancel the election, Americans are not going to jump ship from a leader such as Donald Trump in a time of war to go to Biden or Bernie. Okay, it's not going to happen. The Democratic Party is, it's over. Okay, and I'm not just saying that. I'm saying that based upon the fact that the liberal side comes to its end here, it comes to its end here, and this is the type of paneum on this line of the Constitution. This is where they come to their end um, as a political party. So in agreement, when we first came to understand Paneum, way back when, um, we understood that when you get to Paneum, a lot of things would begin to happen that would be, have a connection with the word pan, okay, because uh, of the story of Caesarea Philippi, Christ being there before he went in Jerusalem. And so, this here at the Sunday Law, what we, were, what we had taught about Pan is perfectly fulfilled in the, the testimony and inspiration about the Sunday Law because at the Sunday Law, this is where Satan is going to personate Christ. So all the, the miraculous satanic miracles and stuff that we would suggest take place at Pan, their perfect fulfillment is at the Sunday Law, and sure enough, at the Sunday Law, that is where the Bible and the spirit of prophecy marks the marvelous working of Satan. So it's right on schedule in those terms. You were going to say something? I was going to ask something. The order you're putting up there on how these different lines are coming to their end, you know, one is already, is there something specific in the order on how they're coming to their end? I, I don't know how to state that. No, I don't know. I don't, maybe, I'm sure there is, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not trying to draw any points about that. I, have a, I don't have anything to say on that. Daniel? Would you consider, I know we've said that, what, where is midnight and all of that? 
the whole history is midnight. Uh-huh. And, and I pers- purposely made that point in here and in Portola. I mean it. Um, midnight, where I started, is November 9th. And it can start before that. Um, but it's definitely November 9th. And why is it November 9th, Brother Daniel? I have a very good argument why. Maybe not as good as yours, or maybe better than yours. What's Probably yours? Better than mine. Write down, uh, this is probably not, not going to answer, but write down the date of this, uh, the whole thing in numbers of uh, December 25th, 2021. 12, 25, 2021? Yeah. 12, 25, 2021. 20, so you have a 25, 20 right smack in the middle of that. Yeah. And you have the 12 and the 20, which are, are inverted. One, which are uh, yeah. backwards. I mean, mirrors. They're, they're opposite of each other. They're mirrors. They're mirrors. Mirrors. And that means what concerning midnight? And 21 represents midnight. Okay. So we have this history leading to here that's bookend with, but this is midnight too. This would be midnight. Because this is the perfect fulfillment of the midnight cry. This is what we call the loud cry, but we've spent time. This is the, the, the perfect fulfillment of the midnight cry, and it takes place at midnight. So you're saying that over here would be midnight, but what I'm saying, my argument about November being midnight is Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. And we know that uh, Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1 is marking... July 21st, 1844, it says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, the fifth day of the fourth month in 1844 was July 21st, which was midnight. I was among the captive by the rivers Kibar, that the heavens were open and I saw the visions of God. So my argument for this being midnight is what? It's the fourth day of the fifth month. Is that what it is? Or the fifth day of the fourth month? Fifth day of the fourth month. Fifth day of the fourth month. Okay, so it's the fifth day of the fourth month. But what is it? That's July 21st. July 21st, but what is it? The 30th year. It's the 30th year. When does this movement begin? November 9th. November 9th, 1989. You're almost there. Where does this movement begin? At midnight. At midnight. At midnight on November 9th, 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down. At midnight. Exactly 30 years later, in the 30th year, you're at November 9th, 2019. At midnight. And this was July 21st, 1844. And that whole history from July 21st, 1844 until October 22nd, 1844 was midnight. It's a period of time. So we've, we're in a period of time here, just like we were in Millerite history. Midnight can be a point in time, but it can also be a period of time. All right, um, that's my argument, 30th year. And this is where Ezekiel's the, the holy place, most holy place is opened up to him and he sees the visions of God and these are the visions that Sister White says these are the visions of Ezekiel, Isaiah, and John. And of course, we mark down here what? September 7th, mm-hmm. being 63 days before and then 63 days after takes us to 1, 1, 1, 20. And this 126 day period is where the Lord opens up the visions of the sanctuary to the wise priest and begins to put them in order. That's what's going on. Okay. Um, so I, I, I just, I'm saying this is the perfect, this is actually Rafi and Paneum. But these other lines have
parallel raffia and pineum, so to speak, but maybe you can't, you shouldn't really truly, truly call them raffia and pineum, but they are in this raffia and pineum. But over here, we know at pineum that Satan's going to do his marvelous work. Therefore, those characteristics that we initially saw with pineum when Pandora's box is opened, when those take place, the first, the first place we're going to see a pineum, if this is correct, is on February 5th, 2020, and that is 2520, right? And that's when he was acquitted. So some of the things you might expect to see after he's acquitted is how about a pandemic? Or how about panic on Wall Street? Okay, so, so there are things that are actually speaking to this kind of, uh, these kind of inferences. And of course, they're only going to get, they're going to get more profound when you get to this pineum and suddenly the world that wants to see can tell that this Elijah the prophet really is the prophet. That he has some kind of connection with the God of heaven to, to rightly see end time events and the, and the Levites come and stand uh, with them. So we got to that sort of in Portola. Um, we spent more time here actually discussing it than there. Uh, this is just a tying these five presentations of Portola together for you. On page one of your notes from today, uh, pardon me? Uh huh. Before it, <coughs> Islam strikes, we know that there always has to be uh, uh, a, because they're a scourge for breaking their punishment for the Sunday law. Yeah, punishment for the Sunday law. So we know that that's supposed to happen. That's happening. And we also know that on the second line, on the internal, that they have rejected the Sunday law. Yeah. So then you see that they're judged on July or shown. Yeah. So what's the third one? Is the because uh, the Constitution they shredded it or I'm not sure. I'm just well, now this is your question. I have doesn't mean necessarily that I've thought through those kind of. Uh, theories, but so let's walk through it together. You're saying that the trumpets are judgments that come in response to a Sunday law, and you're saying that because that's what I've taught here, and I agree with it. And therefore, you're saying that bef if 2520, the acquittal of Donald Trump, is a type of pineum. Does it necessarily bring with it the judgment of December 25th? That's my question. And does December 10th, when the articles of impeachment were put in place by the Democrats, does that have the judgment characteristics of Rafia? Um, Yeah, it, you know, the, you may be able to make that the case, answer that correctly, just by in the Constitution. I think it'd be easy to show that the Constitution, Sister White says that at the Sunday Law, every principle of the Constitution will be repudiated. And so you can probably get in there and argue that before they do the articles of impeachment, that all the logic that they used to create those articles of impeachment were false and therefore outside the the original intent of the Constitution. You can probably make those kind of arguments. And articles of impeachment require that a law be broken and there was no laws broken too, so you could argue that easily. Yeah, but, but I don't know if that answers your question because how, my question then is, is how was December 10th a, a judgment in terms of it's a strike by Islam with a nuclear weapon over on July 18, 2020. So, not, I wasn't trying to dodge this question, but I have been saying all along that I think the perfect fulfillment of Rafi and Paneum is up there in the story of the King of the South, and these other ones are, they're like echoes of that. But what I'm meaning by that is I don't know that they're going to possess all the characteristics that you will see on the top line in the story of the King of the South. To answer his question, which seems really valid, is instead of labeling those Rafi and Neum, you can just label them waymarks with characteristics of the other lines and not not take the 
the Islam part down there. Well, do you see Rafi and Paniyam on line two or three? No. No, I don't do that. I'm, I purposely didn't do that. So you don't need, then you don't need Sunday laws being broken and trumpet powers coming in. Yeah, you can see little echoes of it. You can see, you can see a pattern without having to see every element. Probably so. If we've learned in the past anything about how we label Sunday laws, we need to be. When we're going to say that a Sunday law, Islam responds to a Sunday law, we want to make sure it's a Sunday law, it's concrete. Okay, let me, yeah, let me do one other thing. It's a point we got to at the very end of Portola, but we've been to this point here in this class more than once. And it's on this subject because what what we say up here about Rafia, we've been arguing that May 14th, that this meeting would be the place where the leaders came together and made some kind of action about the Sunday law. But because of the pandemic of coronavirus, I guess this meeting has been put off till October. October 11th to the 18th. Okay. Tentatively. Tentatively. But as much as I liked that meeting, it had a lot of interesting stuff in it. The one thing it didn't have, what didn't it have? Sunday law. No, you, could, you can read into Sunday law even there based upon where that document comes from and the, the, the Pope that first wrote the, the song that it's based upon or the poem. That's not my point. It didn't have, it wasn't lining up with any of the chronology. All these other waymarks, we're seeing these, these chronologies come in, and May 14th didn't have any of those. Do you remember that? What are you looking that way for? Am I wrong, my sister? No? Okay. Um, so I always wondered, well, you know, all these other little future waymarks, there was a 63 or a 126 or a 252 or a 777, but there wasn't with May 14th. It didn't matter to me. I'm not worried about being a time setter anyway. I'm just trying to note what's going on. But we can't move this off. Why can't we move this off? We can't move it off for this reason. And this is, this is review for this class. This history here is the midnight cry to the Sunday law. And it, this is the image test in the USA. And this is the image test in the world. This begins with the first Sunday law, ends with the Sunday law. This begins with the Sunday law, ends with the universal Sunday law over here at the close of probation. Everyone remember that? But this is also actium, and therefore this would be actium. And the Battle of Actium, pagan Rome is going to rule the world supremely for 360 years, from here to here, and then from here to here when it's repeated, because the midnight cry time period is doubled. Yes? But in verse 27 of Daniel 11, it speaks about Anthony and Octavius speaking lies to one another at one table. But the end is not yet because it's for a time appointed. So where does Anthony die? Anthony dies here at the Battle of Actium. So in order for Anthony to speak lies at a table with Octavius, they have to have some kind of meeting before Actium that is marked by Scripture as them, ha whether it's a treaty or whatever, they're having some kind of agreement that they're both lying about. Right? Remember, we put this in place. So, we're, we can mark this as the time of the end. We put this in place. And the reason I'm saying that is, we have two witnesses in Daniel 11 that before the time of the end in 1798, or in... 546 BC, is it? Was it 546? I think it's 546. In 
in six years before that, in five, see, I know how to do it, I got it in my notes. Um, I got it in, in the Bible, margins. The, the king of the south is going to send his daughter to marry the king of the north in um, the year... Oh, 246. No, that's the end of the line. It's, it's 252. Okay? All right, so what I'm saying is this was 35 year period, and right here in 252, the king of the south sends his daughter to marry the king of the north, and we have this this treaty that was put in place that is 3.5 prophetic years that lines up with the 1260 years of papal rule that 1798 as the time of the end, 246 therefore being the time of the end, 246 is preceded by a treaty, the King of the South's daughter given to the King of the North, and this is the Treaty of Torrentino that Napoleon uses as an excuse in seven, to take the Pope captive. And the Treaty of Torrentino was in 1797. This treaty was in 252. These are both the time of the end. This is the time of the end. So in Daniel 11, we have three witnesses to a treaty that takes place before the midnight cry. We have the King of the South's daughter being given to the King of the North in 246. We have the Treaty of Tolentino in 1797. And we have Octavius and Anthony speaking lies to each other at a table before the Battle of Actium. So it doesn't really matter that they've moved this, this meeting. There's got to be some kind of treaty that is broken. And in Portola, when we got to that point, Paul, I believe it was, brought up, and then, then we kind of discounted it. And I'm discounting it, but I'm going to at least throw it out there to get you to think I discount it. He pointed out that, that Trump has broken the nuclear arms treaty, but my argument was is that was made so long ago. I mean, that was made in the time of probably Reagan, I'm not really sure, that maybe it's not the, a treaty that's that gets broken our history that marks that, although it would speak to the, the struggle. But what is Trump? He's the treaty guy. He's making treaties right and left. Uh, with it, Mexico, Canada, Mexico, Japan, China. 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 He's making treaties all over the place. Um, so, you know, he just, he just made one in Afghanistan with the Taliban. Okay, so... Um, May 14th, all I'm saying is the fact that May 14th got moved forward doesn't mean a thing. You've got three witnesses in Daniel 11 that there has to be some kind of treaty as a way mark that's marked before the midnight cry. Well, what, are, what are the characteristics that, of the treaties of those other two lines that we're seeing that are important because that would define what the treaty is? You, you could this one was a peace, break. this was a peace treaty. Between, between... A, a marriage I'm uh, between the United States and Russia. This is a peace treaty between the King of the South and the King of the North. Okay. That's I mean that's how I look at that. Torrentino, I, I forget what the the treaty. It was between Italy and France. I guess that would be the King of the North and the King of the South. Okay. So it must be, it, it, we're probably isolating it into yeah. happen to be a treaty that. Uh, uh, that Russia. Russia and the United States are connected with because Octavius is the king of the north and Anthony is Egypt, the king of the south. So all three witnesses, it's a treaty between king of the north and king of the south. That seems more fair. To know. Yeah, so there's got to be some kind of treaty. So and now that what I was, when Paul brought it up in Portola, I, I give you my argument already is that this nuclear agreement that Trump broke, don't really know when it was made. I, ha I have a hunch it was made in the Ronald Reagan years. Yeah, it, was. it was. Are you positive? Um, okay, so cause that, that there would give you the prophetic justification for saying, yes, it can be that treaty, because yeah. Reagan typifies 
Trump on several levels. So you could take a treaty from the Reagan years and still apply to the Trump years because they're, I mean, Trump, Trump follows perhaps the worst president of history, a liberal, uh, and Reagan follows perhaps the worst president of history, a liberal. The liberal president that preceded Trump made a big mistake with Iran and Reagan says, first day I get in office, we're going to deal with you and they let the hostages go right when Reagan signs in. Uh, Obama makes this crazy agreement with Iran and as soon as Trump gets in, he says, forget about that. Okay, so there's, there's one's a president and another's a president. Um, one's the one that is the president when the Soviet Union comes down at the beginning of verse 40. The other president is the one that when Russia comes down for good. So they're parallel. Um, so I, I, at that, at talking this through, this is probably Trump getting out of the nuclear agreement. And they're talking lies at one table, and the, the result of that is there's going to be a Russian nuclear bomb here in Nashville. And there, there would be a connection between those lies. Um, anyway, I'm not getting as far as I wanted to get. That's where we got to so in Portola. Pardon me? The INF agreement, is that what he got out of? Yeah. Which started yeah. with... Um, Reagan and Gorbachev and was concluded in 91, started in 89 from a document and went to 91. Really? Looks like it, but I'm not going to be... From 89 to 91, the I very... the else checking. The, 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 what do you call that? The bookends of the collapse of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. that typify the bookends of the collapse of Russia. That's got to be the treaty. The landmark Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Agreement established the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to read it. it. Yep. Well, then, where's the, where was any of that logic that this had anything to do with, with the May 14th with the Catholic Church bringing people together on the environment? If, if this is true, what you're saying, which makes a lot more sense than that one, that was just a shot in the dark. No, 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 no. That, this... What we're, what we're coming to now is some clear light on the treaty that gets broken in this story, the King of the South. But everything that we're saying about the efforts of the Pope, including the, the globalism, that's in Daniel 11, but it's not under the, the kingdom of the dragon, it's the, under the kingdom of the beast and it's wrapped up in the story of Fatima. Uh, the fact that he is going to Worship a God who his fathers knew not, which in our day and age is Pachamama. But uh, when the Spanish took control of South and Central America, they came in confrontation with this goddess Pachamama and they incorporated it into the Catholic Church and called it the Virgin Mary. Okay, so the Virgin Mary is the fulfillment of Daniel 11, 38, and 39, but the modern fulfillment of it is Pachamama. And that, that his desire to use global warming as the logic for the redistribution of wealth, and that is what verse 39 speaks of, is speaking to that document that he wrote. And when in earlier, in verse 23, I think it is, Rome is going to come up with a small people. And in, in originally it's saying that the Jews were helping pagan Rome to, to conquer the world. But this is the papacy using minority rights to conquer the world and probably is speaking to the Omega movement in our history where small people are used to do the, the papacy's dirty work, okay? If you, because these, these externals impact the internal. So it's not, it's not changing anything, it's just clarifying it. This, the, the nuclear treaty, that's pretty cool that we, we came in to clarify that. There, has to, there had to be a breaking of the treaty, and if you're, if you're Googling it, when did Trump get out of it? Because he, he's did it in the past year. Yeah, it's been a while and, and would that be on May 14th, though? No, it wouldn't be on May 14th. May 14th isn't up here. December 
December 87 by U.S. President Reagan, the agreement, I'm sorry, December 1987, and the U.S. withdraws from this treaty on August 2, 2019. <clears throat> August From the second. INF Treaty, effective August 2, 2019, and the agreement was signed in December 1987 by U.S. President but, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And it, it, and it started when again? December? 1987. 1987. This is when they spoke the lies. The agreement. It's got the agreement would be where they spoke the lies. 1987. What's the date? It doesn't say. It just says the agreement signed in 1987. Oh, so maybe it has December it. December of 1987. So yeah. Anyway. This is this would be where they spoke the lies, right? Right. Yeah. But this is where they would break the treaty. This is where Laodice is is killing Bernice or vice versa, breaking the treaty. This is where Duf Defoe was uh, ex it was killed by the Vatican Guard. So this is the breaking of the treaty, this is the lies. And your justification for saying that this way mark would be back in December when they're speaking the lies um, and it being broken here um, is the, the relationship of Reagan and Trump. But it wasn't, it looks, I haven't, I'm all read about it later, but it said it wasn't like, it was approved then, but then it was ratified, so it actually stretched all the way into 88 with this approval and ratified. And weren't you talking about a treaty that was used that they put it in place and it wasn't used until later. Isn't that the, on the chart? That treaty that was used, the League of the Jews? They yeah, well, when, it, it, if, if Trump make, it's, it's like the, the Canada-Mexico treaty. Yeah. He, he got that passed. But Pelosi made him wait until after the impeachment for them to ratify it. The Congress wow. has to ratify it. Then it's in place. Up here, they, they make their... Uh, their agreement with the Jews on the other chart, right? here um, it's on the other chart over here but they, don't do it till but they make it in 161 but 158 is when they use it not quite the same okay because okay, in 161 the tree the, the read it was ratified it was in place okay um, I'm not going to get very far into where I wanted to get. So what are you saying about that treaty? What would you summarize that treaty if you were to write it down? All I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to summarize anything yet. What I'm saying is that upon three witnesses, before you get to this waymark, you have to have some kind of treaty that is a waymark. A treaty that is whatever it means by that they spoke lies one to another. It's, it's not a, a treaty that is pure, so to speak. Um, and, and you have it here with them speaking lies with Anthony and Octavius, and you have it here with the King of the North, the King of the North's ex-wife breaking the treaty by executing uh, the daughter from the King of the South and her whole entourage. And here, you have it broken when um, the Vatican Guard kills Dufault, I think is his name, um, and Napoleon uses that as a pretext. So, it's about a broken treaty here. At the end, it's a broken treaty, broken treaty, and evidently a broken treaty here because they go to war so this must be the place. This is where the treaty's broken. Right? Trump breaks the treaty on August 2nd, 2019. Right? If we're worrying about putting that in place. I'm just saying there has to be a waymark of a treaty beforehand. And therefore, there has to be a waymark of a treaty over here. Another one. Because this is Actium also. And this is Actium. And there was a treaty that was broken in, internally in the movement before November 9th as well. A type of a treaty. Yeah, there, it, the, the problem with that, the, it, what Bronwyn's saying is that in this room right over here, we had a meeting 
and we agreed on how the structure of this ministry was going to take place and how it was going to relate to the other ministries in the world. And then when Parminder got to Germany, he turned it totally upside down, went totally against it. Now, the problem with that... I mentioned uh, that in the meeting. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we discussed this in Portola. Go back. You got a baby in there you're taking care of. It was, I thought it was very now significant the, because they said lies on Portola. Yeah, this is the problem I'm getting to. Let me put it in where they can hear. The problem with that, and it's not a problem, is it means that Parminder was speaking lies and so was I. Because they spoke lies one to another at one table. Okay, so... It's easy enough to point to his lies and not say anything, but I got to point to my lies. And, and my lies were, and at that time, is that I was retiring. I meant it, but it wasn't true. And that we were willing to allow him to lead this movement. Um, and I meant it, but it wasn't true. Uh, because he wasn't going to uphold his part of the agreement and... And I didn't have the spiritual authority to go into retirement. I had to do it to fulfill prophecy. So I just want to be clear that, yes, I'm acknowledging that means that Future for America had to tell some lies too. But I'm saying, we're going to make our lies white lies, okay? Your lies were against God, which are more dangerous. He was lying to man. I mean, he's... Our lies were against God, which were, makes it saying, more dangerous. You were Jonah. You're saying he says go, and you said no. And so you, you get to deal with God. He, he's just sitting there dealing with the common man. I'm getting to deal with you as soon as this class is over, all right? <clears throat> There's another facet of this arms control thing that would line up with what you were saying on that second way, Mark, because it says arms control advocates still worry that America's exit from the INF Treaty will lead to the two nations also to scrap the larger New START Treaty, which expires in 2021. So we have two arms control treaties with them, one that auto expires in 2021. Probably that one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And then the one that he exited. So there's actually two, and he only exited one, but it auto expires in 2021. Interesting. Called New Start. Okay. That's pretty cool. New Start. That sounds like, like it's Adventist. We yeah. Okay. Um... I want you to see here in your, on page one of your notes, and I'm already over time. No, I'm, that's just getting close. I took some time to show th the triple application of World War I, World War II, identifying World War III. And I'm, I want to put this in place. There, you can read this on your own. It's, not, it's nothing that's unfamiliar to you. It's just kind of an overview that you had a... a a progressive, uh, a president that is especially known for being a progressive, Wilson, during World War I as the president, and he is the, the main guy that, that pushes in the League of Nations. So you have World War I that leads into, and you can't separate World War I from the story of the League of Nations, which, is, which I'm saying that after World War I you have this globalist organization put in place and it lasts the League of Nations lasts up until the World War II time frame when once again you have a progressive president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, probably had more long-term negative impact on the United States than any other president. Um, he gets into a war and at the end of that war you have a, uh, the United Nations set up. Therefore, upon a triple application of prophecy, when you get to the Third World War, um, at the conclusion, the end of the Third World War, you should see a movement for a globalist organization. That's just a simple level there of what it is. And so what I'm suggesting by triple application of prophecy, so the part I probably never said before, and, and I'm open for correction on, but I don't think it needs to be corrected, okay, is it? That World War III begins here. And it ends here. It ends on December 25th, 2021. World War III is over. And I'm saying that because on December 25th, 2021, now you have the threefold union in place. You have the 
one world government that the League of Nations and the United Nations point forward to. And yes, it is the United Nations, but it's the United Nations with the United States strength and authority guiding it and the United States being directed and controlled by the papacy. They're all together at the, at the Sunday Law, the Threefold Union. And what I'm saying is in this history, this isn't world war. This is when Rome is ruling the world supremely, whether it's the 360 years of Daniel 11, 24, or the 1260 of papal rule. And yes, it's going to be a bloodbath, and there's going to be persecution going on, but it's, it's not a world war in that sense. The world, world War III ends right here. Now, if you, if you accept that logic, um, you have a secondary witness to that, but it's a satanic witness. But it is the story of Fatima. Fatima teaches that because the popes would not do what the angels told the three children they needed to do and call the conclave um, in the early part of the 20th century, because they rejected that call, that the world would have to go through a third world war and that it would be a, a limited nuclear war, very short, where some entire nations would be destroyed, is the Fatima prophecy. But the Third World War would end with the return of Jesus. And the Fatima prophecy says, they know it's Jesus when he returns, because when he returns he calls fire down out of heaven inside of men. So, if you were to plug this satanic Fatima prophecy into this history here, and say that this nuclear attack in Nashville begins a limited nuclear war, but it is the Third World War, and it goes all the way to December 25th, then that would agree with the Fatima prophecy of having a very short, limited, l Third World War with nuclear weapons. But more importantly, we know from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that immediately after the Sunday Law in Revelation 13, 13, 13, 13, rebellion, rebellion, this is where Satan personates Christ. And how does he do it? He calls fire down out of heaven. And that's what Catholicism has been trained to believe proves that he is Jesus. So this, by identifying the Third World War as July 18th to December 25th, you're in agreement with the First World War and the Second World War that these world wars lead to a globalist move, a global organization be established. The League of Nations was World War I, the United Nations is World War II, and this is the Threefold Union United Nations, if we can call it that, that's established right here. And I don't have time now, but at the other, I'll start this on Wednesday when we get back from Texas. But I have a secondary argument for this, which, which is the proxy wars. And I've taken the proxy wars farther than we've taken them here before, so there's some other stuff to do with that that we'll deal with next time. But the proxy wars are going to show us that, that the history of 1989 to 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union, is illustrating the collapse of Russia. And they're both the collapse of the King of the South, uh, but one's the, the collapse of the modern king of the south in the beginning and then the collapse of the modern king of the south at the end. So we take Gorbachev's move from the Soviet Union to the United Nations and it's illustrating Russia as the king of the south being merged into the United Nations, ceasing to be its own entity. Um, and that takes place over a period of time from November, uh, November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991. So I'm saying this destruction of Russia ends here on December 25th, 2021, and it probably comes back and begins here, um, a progressive demise. But more importantly, from here to here, I'm arguing that the world is going to recognize forensically, if that's the right way to say it, that the nuclear weapon that Islam uses on Nashville forensically has the fingerprints of Russia on it. 
And it does not necessarily mean that Russia or that Trump has to strike back with nuclear weapons against Russia. It, mean, it could mean, and I'm saying it does mean, that the population of Russia is going to recognize what Putin has done and rise up against him the same way the population of the Soviet Union rose up against the communists and Gorbachev and that history and therefore from here to here the demise of Russia is more about the Russia population bringing that country to a conclusion as a world leader as it did with the Soviet Union. Um, but I'm saying that probably the motivation for that is that the world's going to recognize that the nuclear weapons that Islam d did use came from Russia. Yes? You said earlier that on the Mohammed one, Mohammed II, when he went and did that, you're parallel in that 1449 period and in the middle, this cannon maker, you said Urban. He, Urban, he tried to sell it first to Rome? Are we putting any kind of application on that today? Is that right? Did you say that's that? right? That, that's the story. He, he was he was a cannon maker and he was he was sympathetic with he wasn't pro-islamic let's put it that way but he was starving to death but so was the roman empire at that time period they didn't have the money to resist islam so when when he came to the roman leadership and said hey i have a cannon uh, that can put you back in ship shape in terms of your military prowess they didn't have the money to buy it from him so the story is Urban reached out to Muhammad and says, Urban? You are B A N. A N, I guess. Urban. Okay, go ahead. Uh, he reached out to Muhammad and Muhammad says, I'll take it. So that's part of the story. Whatever, however that would play out in our day and age, uh, that that's basically uh, the way some of us have thought it through is okay, there's some uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was some very sophisticated scientists working for the Soviet Union that know how to build nuclear weapons and stuff. Uh, they're out of jobs when the Soviet Union collapses. They go out, look for jobs in the Western world, can't get them, no one needs nuclear bomb makers now, but they somehow end up in Islam. Uh, O-R-B-A-N. O-R-B-A-N, Orban. Orban. Father in heaven, we see these lines as very simple but very complex uh, but we are blessed that they are finally lining up in a way uh, where we can mark what's taking place on planet earth and see that we're on the path that you want us to be on we ask that you continue to open up the light on this uh, these subjects that we can um, be guided all the way to the end on this path that you're opening before us. I ask a blessing upon this day's work, um, a blessing upon this message as it goes out over the internet, and we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.